Okay, good evening everybody. You're very welcome to the Centre for Divine Will here in Dublin, Ireland, uh, for our debate tonight. With uh, on my right hand side, Michael Nugent, uh, Chairperson for Atheism, Atheism Ireland, and on my left, Hugh Ong, from the Cold Bay Institute for Creation. The title for discussion is that be it resolved that the existence of a supernatural, personally intervening creator is better supported by reason and by the evidence of natural science than the non-existence of a supernatural creator, <coughs> that is, atheism. And both speakers will speak for 10 minutes each, then a break, and then for another five minutes each, and then a conclusion, and we'll have questions and then it'll be open discussion. So the first speaker is uh, Hugh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Mary, conceive without sin, pray for us, we are recourse to thee. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, first, I would like to um, begin by acknowledging the fact that Everybody in this room, by virtue of being here, is a practical theist, even though some of us may be theoretical atheists. Um, in the first place, everybody in this room tonight has acknowledged that the world is objectively real and intelligible, or else we would not have found our way here and we would not have participated in a debate whose object is to determine the truth of a proposition. Secondly, everyone here acknowledges that the world is orderly. We all fully expected the law of gravity to be in force on our way here, and we continue to expect that to be the case. Everyone in this room acknowledges that we have free will. If you doubt that, if someone invited us out to dinner and he told all of us, well, Free will is just an illusion, so I'm going to decide what you're going to eat. We would all be up in arms, because whatever we may be in theory, in practice, we all know that we have free will. And finally, everyone in this room acknowledges that there is an absolute moral standard. This is easy to prove. If someone said, let's bring a child of five years old in this, in this room and torture her to death on video for our entertainment, Everyone in this room would acknowledge that that is wrong. It's wrong anywhere, anytime, because it violates an absolute moral standard. So let's examine some reasons why it makes sense for us not only to be practical theists, but believers in a supernatural creator. We have very little time, so I would like to focus on an argument by the a uh, modern philosopher Mortimer Adler, which goes like this. Anything that always has been must be the way it is. The universe could be different than it is. We could have different planets. We could have different kinds of galaxies, etc. Therefore, the universe cannot have always existed. It must owe its existence to some unchanging being, the God of Christianity, is a perfect, unchanging being who created the universe out of nothing. Now, this belief in a supernatural creator is consistent with fundamental principles of common sense. For example, no effect is greater than its cause. We all operate by this principle every day. Simple example, if we had a balance scale here, and on one pan we put a one kilo weight, and on the other pan we put a two kilo weight, it's not going to balance. If it did, it would violate the principle that no effect can be greater than its cause. A one kilo weight cannot produce the effect of a two kilo weight. Now, a supernatural creator bringing into existence the entire universe harmonizes with this fundamental principle because the supreme being brings into existence beings that are lower in being than himself. But in all naturalistic scenarios for the coming into existence of different kinds of creatures, this principle is violated. 
because in all naturalistic, atheistic scenarios, the cause is always bringing into existence an effect that is greater than itself. For example, the common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans is said to bring into existence a human being, which is impossible. Now, we know that we can also tell something about the creator of the universe by looking at the things that he has made. We know that every living thing, even the quote-unquote simplest living thing, is full of very complex coded information. This information is encoded and therefore it has to be the product of a mind and a free will. This is a fundamental principle of information theory. It's easy to prove. Imagine your children and you're playing with your cousins upstairs in your house and you want to have a code to let everybody know whether it's mommy or daddy coming up the stairs. So you agree that one knock will mean mommy's coming and two knocks will mean that dad is coming. That's a very simple code, but in order to have it, you must have a mind to say knock equals mommy and you must have a free will to decide that it's going to be one knock and not two or three or four or something else. So, the mere fact that all living things contain complex coded information proves that this came from a very powerful mind and free will. How powerful? Well, Bill Gates is something of an expert on computer software and he says DNA is like a computer program but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever <coughs> created. In fact, the DNA in the cells of all living things, even the simplest, uses overlapping messages and DNA sequences are polyfunctional. In fact, recently scientists have discovered that the same DNA sequence is written in more than one language. I would challenge anybody in this room to even write a three-word sentence that makes sense in two different languages. It will probably keep you up for a very long time. Not only does the DNA have this kind of complexity, the, the, DNA, the information storage technology in the simplest living things far surpasses what human engineers have been able to produce after decades of effort. This is a 2TB hard drive. It holds a little bit less than 2 trillion uh, bit bytes of information. And the storage capacity of one pinhead of DNA is equal to 2 million 2TB hard drives. Now, the schools are telling our young people that this information storage technology somehow came about through a random process. <coughs> And yet our smartest engineers working for decades haven't been able to produce an information storage technology that comes close to equaling it. In addition to this, we know that all human beings have an experience of guilt when they violate the absolute moral standard. This is easy to prove. If we in this room witnessed the torture of a five-year-old child for entertainment purposes, we would all be consumed with guilt, unless we were completely insane. If this was a room full of chimpanzees, that would not be the case. They could watch a child being tortured for entertainment and not experience any guilt whatsoever. We also, as human beings in all societies since the beginning of human history, link this guilt over doing things that are wrong with our fear of death. And this points to another very important fact which is that in all societies all over the world from the beginning of recorded history people have had a memory of the one God who created the heavens and the earth and all they contain they have had an understanding that that God is the judge of the world and that in order to be acceptable to that judge they must be able to find forgiveness for their sins in the uh, Hebrew scriptures we are told that God identifies himself as the creator of the universe, he has power over all nature, and he promises to send a God-man into the world who will demonstrate that he is God by, by showing that he has complete power over everything in the material universe. And that promise is fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ, who fulfills hundreds of prophecies made hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before he appears. 
He walks on water. He gives sight to the blind. He raises the dead, a corpse that's been four days in the tomb. He brings to life by his word. And then he fulfills his promise to resurrect on the third day. One minute. So, we've seen that we have uh, evidence that shows us that there must be a supreme, unchanging being who supplies the being to this contingent universe. And we've seen that all human beings have an innate knowledge of an absolute moral standard and of the existence of this supreme being. And we've seen that our Lord Jesus Christ fulfills predictions that were made hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before he came into the world, and that he demonstrated the absolute mastery over nature, over all of creation, which authenticates his claim, unique among all the prophets who have ever lived, to actually be the God who created the heavens and the earth and all they contain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, I think it's important in any discussion like this that we all start by accepting that it's possible that we might be mistaken. If we, if we start off by being adamant that our beliefs are true, uh, then we're not going to have any sort of a reasonable discussion. Um, Hugh quoted uh, Bill Gates earlier on, and um, if, if I was to say to you now that, that I was talking to Bill Gates on the way here, and he said to me that he's going to give everybody here ten million dollars if you agree with me on the motion tonight. You immediately realise that's wrong. Yet if I told you that I spoke to the creator of the universe today, and that if he told me that if you do what I say that he'll give you an eternity in paradise, some of you would believe me. And that's a bit strange really, because th there's more evidence that it's possible or likely or probable that Bill Gates gives people money than there is that the creator of the universe exists, objectively speak. That's because religion corrupts our sense of reality. What religion does and faith does is normally, if we're asked to believe whether something is true or not, what we do is we compare it to the evidence. And the, the more improbable a claim seems, the higher the bar of the evidence that we require in order to believe it. But with, re with religion, we do the exact opposite. The more improbable the claim becomes, the less evidence we require in order to believe it. In, in fact, we go to the extent that we will, will believe claims that are literally untestable. And on that basis, we'll lead our lives on the basis of these untestable claims. Which is fine if you happen, just by coincidence, to be right. But um, even if there is a creator, as Homer Simpson said in The Simpsons, when Marge was trying to get him to go to church. He said, but what if we pick the wrong religion, Marge? Every week we're just making God madder and madder. So you've got to realize that even if you believe that there is a creator, there are so many different versions that people believe of that creator that you would be very lucky to have picked the correct one. Now you'd think you'd pick the correct one because you believe it subjectively, but actually subjective evidence is the least reliable way of knowing anything. You don't apply it to anything else uh, in, in, in your life. In, in your normal day-to-day -day life, you believe things proportionally to the evidence, and where there are differences of opinion, you will believe things that are objectively testable by different people, and where different people will all come to the same conclusion when they evaluate the same evidence. That's not the case with religion. If there, if there is a creator, uh, he, she, or it seems to be a remarkably poor communicator in that they seem to be giving different messages to different people all around the world uh, and seem unable to give the same message to everybody. If a creator, a personal intervening creator, was giving the same message to everybody around the world, that might be some uh, uh, credence given to the idea that it exists. But in its absence, there is far more evidence to suggest that gods are ideas that are invented by humans in order to explain things that we, did, that we didn't previously understand. And every generation we understand more and more about how the universe operates naturally. And every generation, the bits that we don't yet understand, some of us attribute to gods. <coughs> Centuries ago, people believed that thunder and rain was the gods being angry. Now we understand that it isn't. Um, centuries ago, people believed that, um, that people with mental illnesses were possessed by demons. 
now we know how to treat men mental illnesses. There, there are so many examples of previously uh, religious explanations being overtaken by scientific explanations. And there's nothing going in the opposite direction. There's, there's nothing where at one time we thought we had a good scientific explanation, but now we think that it's more likely that God did it. So you, you have a constant stream of, uh, of natural explanations overtaking religious explanations. In, in terms of, say, if, if you take in terms of, of, of what we're talking about in terms of a creator and the, the universe and a supernatural creator, at one stage, we, and by we I mean human beings, thought that, that, the, uh, that the earth was, was at the centre of everything and, and that the heavens were above the earth. And then we gradually discovered that, that, um, that, that in fact, the, the earth is orbiting uh, the sun, and then we discovered that the sun is merely one of, of the billions of stars and that it's not even the centre of our solar system. We now don't know that there are a hundred billion galaxies, each of which has a hundred billion stars like our sun, many of which have planets uh, revolving around them. And the idea that even if there was a creator that all of that was created, think of it, a hundred billion galaxies each of which is a hundred billion stars like our sun. The idea that that was all created for the benefit of human beings, one species on one of those billions and billions of planets, is, um, is self-centered in the extreme. You know, we're not that important in the overall scheme of things. Even if you believe there is a creator, it, it, it would have an extraordinary set of priorities to create something that vast uh, in order to, to um, benefit, coincidentally, those of us who believe in, 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 in it on, on planet Earth. Now, um, if you go back if you, if you, to, to what we are finding out, we, we then discovered scientifically uh, that, that our galaxy is not even the centre of the universe, and we discovered that, that in fact the planets and, sta that and the stars are, are all moving away from each other at, at unimaginable speeds. And, th and that those speeds can be calculated by the, the, the variations of, of wavelengths of lights co coming from, from the stars. And then somebody had the the brainwave of looking at this rationally and saying, well, if the planets and, or if the stars and, and galaxies are all moving away from each other at these great speeds, then if we run the film backwards, so to speak, at some stage, they were all closer together. And, were, and, and that was calculated backwards uh, in, in, in time to about 14 billion years ago, when everything, all matter that, that exists in the known universe and energy in the known universe was in, a, in an unimaginably small um, space uh, from which the, the Big Bang is the best scientific explanation for, uh, for how the universe, as we know, came, came to e evolve. Now, the next question is what happened before the Big Bang? And there's two things I want to say about that. First of all, we don't know. Scienti scientists don't know, and religious people don't know. The difference between scientists and religious people is scientists don't claim to be, to be able to know. Scientists will just say, we don't yet know. In the same way as we didn't know centuries ago how electricity works, and now we do, scientists will wait until such time as we can explain things and then say we know it. Scientists, and, and, and generally atheists as well, although it's not a complete um, overlap, a broad overlap, we're generally cautious in what we believe. Because we know that we can't know everything, we will withhold believing until such time as we have sufficient evidence to, to, uh, to make it uh, worth believing in on the, the probability of, of, of the evidence. So we don't know what happened before the Big Bang, and even the phrase before the Big Bang is kind of, might be meaningless <coughs> because time came at the time that we experienced came into being at the, the at, well, very shortly after the Big Bang as part of the space-time um, continuum. But if we look at the overwhelming pattern of previous religious explanations for reality being repeatedly overtaken by scientific natural explanations, it seems reasonable to assume, unless we have very strong evidence to the contrary, that when or if we find out what happened before the Big Bang, that it will be a natural explanation rather than a supernatural explanation. And this whole idea of supernaturalism, it, it's kind of like a makey uppy word for things we don't yet understand. 
If we don't understand something, you say, well, it's supernatural. But let's say we did find, even if we did find there was a God, it wouldn't mean it's supernatural. It would just mean there's something else natural that we didn't understand before. And now we do understand. The word, the word supernatural doesn't add anything to the discourse. It just, it, it just means something outside the, the, what we know of the, the, um, of the laws of nature. Um, but but it, it, that's all it is. It's just a word. The, the, in terms of the motion, I'll just close by saying in terms of the, the words in the motion, a, a creator is, is based on the principle that, that something can't come from nothing and therefore a creator must have created it. But that's not what comes from something can't come from nothing. If something can't come from, come from nothing, then the logic from that is there was always something. Not that there was nothing and then a creator created something out of that nothing. In terms of an intervening creator, there is uh, sufficient evidence that the world operates naturally uh, and, and that um, supposed miracles and supposed uh, intervention by prayers uh, don't stand up to, to, to analysis and we can examine that later if, if we have time. In terms of a personal creator, that's purely wishful thinking. It's anthropomorphizing that people used to believe when, when, the, when the, it was a thunder that the gods were angry. Um, and, and, and similarly, when we don't understand, uh, when we see patterns that we don't understand the cause of, we anthropomorphize that and say it's a god. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by pointing out that we have much better documentation with regard to the life the miracles and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ than we have of any event in, in ancient history. And we have the testimony of eyewitnesses who were willing to forego everything that this world can offer and suffer torture and death rather than deny the truth of what they had seen, namely, especially, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead after he had been subject to torture and death by professional killers. Jesus Christ demonstrated total mastery over all of nature and therefore authenticated his claim to be one with God who created the heavens and the earth and all they contain. And things that he revealed explain why the objections that have been made here really do not hold up under scrutiny because our Lord Jesus Christ confirmed to us that the universe did not come into existence through the same kinds of material processes that are going on now. The claim of naturalistic thinkers has been that by studying the same material processes that are going on now, we can explain the origins of stars, galaxies, life, plants, and animals. The reality is that cutting-edge natural science in every discipline has proven to us that in fact the starting point of our Lord Jesus Christ and his church namely that we can't explain the origins of these things in terms of present processes is far more reasonable for example um, Mr. Nugent mentioned that evolution works through this process of natural selection but it's easy to prove that natural selection does not produce any new biological information. Where did this biological information come from? Scientists have been looking for more than 50 years for some example of new biological information coming into existence that could explain the appearance of a new organ or a new function. They have found none. Zero. So the evidence in genetics agrees with what our Lord Jesus Christ revealed. And we cannot explain the origins of the things that we see in nature in terms of the material processes that are going on now. What's more, the false belief that we can explain the origins of these things through the present processes has been the biggest disaster that ever happened to natural science. I only have time to give you one example. Beginning in the 1970s, it became mainstream in biology to argue that the 97% of the human genome that does not code for protein was junk. The reason? It was logical that since we didn't understand the function, it must be a holdover from all those millions of years of evolution. This is one of hundreds of examples I could give you where this faith in uniformitarian naturalism retarded scientific progress. 
when the Human, human Genome Project was finally launched, it was discovered that virtually all of the quote-unquote junk DNA is functional. Now, who knew that the quote-unquote junk DNA would be functional? The people who believed in the Christian revelation. Because scientists who work within that framework presume stable form and function throughout nature. Naturalists have come to presume flux and dysfunction. This is why a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, it was mainstream in the natural sciences to argue that there were over a hundred vestigial organs in the human body, including the appendix, the tonsils, and so on. This retarded scientific progress. It was the people who worked within the creation framework provided by Christianity who knew that this couldn't possibly be true because God created man as man and woman as woman in the beginning with all their organs. These were the people who pushed to investigate the function of the appendix, the tonsils, and the other quote-unquote vestigial organs. They were the true pioneers, the ones who advanced science, because every single one of those vestigial organs has now been found to be fully functional. Who advanced science? The people who believed in the creation framework. Who retarded science? The people who believed in this false naturalistic framework. The greatest proof, however, that there is a supernatural creator is not the physical miracles, it's the moral miracles. Everyone knows who studies it that, okay, well, I'll save those remarks for the later discussion if we have time. Thank you. Okay, the, the main points that I'd just like to, to respond to um, from what he was saying, first of all, the idea, uh, actually, first of all, I'm going to preface it by saying the, the, the idea of starting with prayer may seem very reasonable to those of you who are religious, um, but if you're not religious, it, 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 the, the message that, that sends is we're not open to listening to what you're saying. We have our beliefs. We're going to reinforce our beliefs before we even listen to you. That's the message that non-religious people get. Now, pray, if you pray at a church, that's perfectly fine. Pray at the start of a debate. That's the message that you're, that you're, that you're sending out to non-religious people. Um, in terms of evolution being a, a random process, evolution isn't a random process. It's almost the opposite of a random process. And it shows a misunderstanding of, of, of how evolution happens. Um, the, what evolution basically is, is, is that organisms are, are either well or not well suited to surviving in the environment that they're in. The ones that are best suited to surviving will live long enough to reproduce and will have children. The ones that are not well suited will die off um, and, and, and therefore over time the, the, the ones that are most suited will, will reproduce more effectively. Now sometimes there are genetic mutations that are random. But evolution is not the genetic mutations. Evolution is that if the genetic mutations are useful in terms of survival, if, if, if um, a being has a slightly longer neck in an environment where food is high up, then those beings will get more food, will, will, will uh, live longer, will reproduce more, and those genes will be passed on to the next generations and will survive. But it's not random. It's the, it's the opposite of random. It's, it's those... Uh, randomly generated <coughs> mutations that are objectively beneficial in the environment that the creature is living in uh, that, that causes uh, evolution to happen. The second point I'll make, because I know we're short on time, is, is the idea of morality. And uh, uh, he was talking about the idea of, of we all have a, a sense of morality, which I, I think we do. I, I think it's based on evolution. I think we are, essentially our, our morality is... Um, is, is that we, if you imagine for a second, I know it's hard for you to do, but imagine there's no God and imagine, but I'm assuming if there's no God, you're not just going to go out murdering people simply because there's no God, that, that you will still have a sense of right and wrong. And I suspect that it's based on things like empathy and compassion and cooperation and reciprocity and fairness and justice. These are all senses that you have. Um, you you, you realise that, it, that it's wrong, as you were saying, Hugh, to, to cause unnecessary suffering, um, that, that, it, that it's right to, to help sentient beings to, to flourish and, and to, to um, experience well-being. Now, all of those things happen naturally, but what religion does is it adds into that mix an extra kind of... Uh, complicating factor, which is say, here are things that you should do, even though you know that it's not compassionate, and you know that, it, that it's going to cause suffering, but you should do it anyway, because somebody wrote something in, in a book 200 years ago. 
or 2,000 years ago, rather. And when you were saying, in, in terms of we know that something is, is, um, is, is wrong, that torturing a, a five-year-old child is, is, is wrong regardless, now, if you attribute that to a creator, then what you've got to ask is, did the creator, let's assume the creator exists for a second, um, does the creator cause torturing a five-year-old child to be wrong simply by saying, because I say it's wrong, therefore it's wrong? Or does the creator recognise that it's wrong and just point out to people, that's wrong um, because of X, Y, Z reasons, rather than just because I happen to think so. Now, if you believe the first, if you believe that the creator just, just, uh, just decides that things are right or wrong, then if the creator had decided that it was right to uh, torture a five-year-old child, morality is essentially arbitrary. It's based on the whim of the creator. And if you say no, it wouldn't. The creator wouldn't. And the creator would only cho choose to, to say the things that are good anyway. He, he couldn't say that torturing a child is, is, um, is, is right. Then that means that the creator is using some, uh, some criteria independently of him or her or itself to say, I'm saying that that's wrong, right or wrong, not simply because I happen to say it, but because, um, because it is right or wrong. And if there are those independent criteria then we can access those criteria ourselves. And I suggest that we do access those criteria ourselves through empathy and compassion and fairness and justice and cooperation and reciprocity. So even if there is a creator, the idea that the, that, that creator um, is responsible for absolute morality doesn't stand up to analysis. So I, I think we're probably out of time now. I'll, I'll leave it at that and we'll probably get back to this after the discussions.